Right, so we'll quickly move on because we've got um, Professor Tom Burns with us now, uh, who doesn't really need an introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Uh, in 2006, he received a CBE for services to mental health, uh, and he's most well known for his research in CTOs, which he's going to be talking to us about now. He's got a taxi waiting at half two, so I'll shut up. Professor Tom. Well, thank you very much indeed for that introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to Manchester. It's been an inspirational meeting, I have to say, to listen to the presentations we've had this morning. I'm going to lower the tone an awful lot by giving you facts and figures and boring things like that. I thought before I did that, I'd mention something which many of you may not know. Uh, do you know what the Swedish word is for corduroy? It's Manchester. Uh, I have a Swedish wife, that's how I know this. So if you have Manchester trousers, if you have corduroy trousers, they're Manchester trousers, Manchester jacket, and it's all because the bales that delivered it to Sweden, the fabric, had Manchester stamped on them, and the Swedes don't uh, change quickly. Right, uh, I'm going to talk to you about CTOs, <clears throat> and because it's getting on a bit, I've deleted a number of the slides that are in your pack, but they're there if you want to consult them. And you'll see from the title that I've come to a conclusion that CTOs don't work. And this is a painful conclusion for me, because I've spent 20 years, 20 years advocating for the introduction of CTOs. CTOs have been available for about 40 years. They're, they're available in about 70 countries around the world. And after about 20 years of, of arguing and discussion, in which, as I say, I was a fairly active contributor, they were introduced in 2007 to England and Wales. It's worth stopping and thinking for a second, why were they introduced and why were they introduced then? Uh, obviously, in any medical intervention, and I'm going to use medical broadly to mean a treatment, something you do to somebody because they're ill in some sort of way, uh, the, 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 the primary purpose and the overwhelming purpose must be that it should improve their well-being and get them better or improve how they're doing in some way. And to some extent, CTOs were introduced in the hope that they would reduce relapses in people with chronic psychotic disorders. That's to say that instead of uh, going out of hospital, stopping taking their medicine, uh, uh, becoming unwell and back into hospital within six or nine months, you'd lengthen that period of them staying well. And hopefully, if they stayed well long enough, they'd re-engage with society and see the benefit in their own mind of continuing with the treatment. So the, the whole purpose of a CTO is to give somebody the stability to transition to voluntary care. I had the uh, interesting experience of being the psychiatric advisor to the scrutiny committee that examined this legislation. And it became clear to me that although that's the primary purpose they were introduced, it was not the only purpose. <clears throat> uh, it was very clear that the politicians wanted to restore public confidence in mental health services, which are always under attack from the Daily Mail and whatever. So they wanted to, re to reassure the public that they were doing something to reduce violent incidents and patients lost to care. They also wanted to reassure families, to demonstrate that they were listening to, to the concerns of families of severely ill uh, people. And as we've heard very, very uh, movingly this morning, looking after somebody who's seriously ill, somebody you love, actually drains all your resources. So we wanted to do whatever could be done to help there. I think, and this is the paranoid bit of me, uh, that they also wanted to alter the relationship between the government and mental health staff. Basically, they wanted to put us in our place a little bit and say, there's legislation to tell you what to do. None of this business of the GMC and professional responsibility. Um, there's also the obvious thing, uh, and I'll come back to this, that we are dealing here with very severe disorders and nobody, don't believe anybody who tells you they've got the answer. Uh, we've been struggling with how to help people with psychotic illnesses for 200 years. We're a hell of a sight better than we used to be, but nobody has something that works for everybody. And so to some extent, one sometimes needs a therapeutic fig leaf to, to cover our impotence. We want to be seen to be doing something uh, therapeutically. But another interesting point, and this is interesting in the international context, because in this we are quite different, for instance, to America, and this was very explicit, is that CTOs were not a mechanism for rationing care. Uh, the, the legislation is absolutely explicit 
that you only consider a CTO when a patient has had everything that you can do and it isn't working. So it's not that certain people will have the extra care if you're on a CTO. And the reasons for that were well thought out, very, and I think very correct. They, you don't want a perverse incentive to put somebody on a CTO because they'll get better care. And also you don't want to shift uh, the balance of care. So that's to some extent why they're introduced. But as I said at the beginning, the main reason they're introduced is to improve patients' well-being. And now it does get a bit boring because I'm going to get into, the, if you want, the technicalities of psychiatric and medical research. We live in what's called the era of evidence-based practice. That's to say that for the last 30 to 40 years, uh, you have to uh, defend your practice in terms of what, what your profession knows about it. Not what your teacher taught you, not what you think is a good idea, but that actually you should draw on the uh, sum of all the evidence that, that is available. And this is this has persisted now for 30 or 40 years, and it's become in many ways a very refined art in itself. And we have what's called the hierarchy of evidence, and I'm sure all of you know this, that to some extent you can't always have complete evidence on everything. The whole point of that science is to reduce uncertainty. You can't be absolutely certain. But what you do is you move up this hierarchy. Uh, you, you can have case reports, often very important for rare disorders, but not much important for, for common disorders. You can have what are called cohort studies when you just follow illnesses that are treated and untreated. You can then have, um, in which you compare people who are treated and those who are not treated and that sort of thing. But then, if you're still not certain, you go to experimental tests. And that is, you have a controlled trial. You randomly allocate people as closely as possible, two populations, one gets the treatment, one doesn't get the treatment, and then you, you decide at the end of, of a given period, and you say that before you do the study, you decide at the end of a given period which group does better. And very important here, you decide before you do the study how you're going to judge the outcome. There's no point in deciding that afterwards, you, because if you keep analysing a big data set, you'll always find something interesting. You say before you do it, we will test CTOs, uh, we'll test their effect uh, over the period of say, over a year, and we will judge their outcome in a specific way. And the way that every randomised controlled trial has tested CTOs is by the rate of relapse. What proportion of people relapse and are readmitted to hospital on a CTO compared to those who are not on a CTO? Now, I'm going to suggest to you, um, and some people disagree with this, but I'm going to suggest to you that CTOs very specifically need randomised controlled trials. Not all interventions require a randomised controlled trial, but CTOs, I suggest, very much need them. Uh, they need them partly because it's a long-term effect you're looking for, and it's not an absolute effect. So you're looking for a, a, a percentage difference over a long period. But there's some other very important reasons why we need an RCT here. How many of you read this international bestseller? I'm, I'm an absolutely naive con. I, was con. I bought it because I was told everybody had read it. It's very long, and it's, uh, but it's very interesting. This, Daniel Cannon, is a Nobel Prize winning neuro, uh, uh, um, cognitive neuroscientist. And he has explored how we as human beings assess risk. And there are three crucial experiments that he conducted, in this, which he relays in this book and for which he got the Nobel Prize. The first is that we, as human beings, always assume that if A is, is followed by B, we, our default assumption is that A caused B. It's called the attributional bias. We always assume things cause each other. Um, and and that's, that's the, if you want, the basis of many, many superstitions and what have you. So we're pattern-seeking primates. We assume something causes the next thing that happens. Uh, and that's a very risky thing in medicine. Secondly, and this is the perhaps more, more difficult one to get your head around, is when we understand how perception works, we realise that we see what we believe. We don't believe what we see. The brain works by projecting outwards in perception what it's anticipating, and then testing, does it see what it's expecting to see? And, and that's called the heuristic bias. And all human beings do this all the time. We're not a tabula rasa. We don't just 
spot that's going on around us. We have assumptions, expectations, and we're looking for them rather than simply observing the world around us. And the third thing that's particularly relevant to some of the very poor quality research in CTOs is what's called regression to the mean. That is to say, in anything that fluctuates, if you pick it up at any specific point at which it's extremely noticeable, it will almost invariably get better because you're picking it up when it's at its worst. So by definition, the people who come up for CTOs are going to do a bit better afterwards because usually you put them on the CTOs after a period of them being at their worst. So bear those three things in mind. I would suggest that without um, using something like a, a randomized control trial, we're always going to be victims of, of this, this human faulty thinking. Now, when, when the, the law was introduced, um, was there any research? Well, there was. Uh, there was a review done by Churchill, which, which the Department of Health commissioned. And basically, the Churchill Review of about 72 papers, this was published in 2006, had two important findings. The first is, and this is reassuring, wherever you go in the world, Australia, America, Camberwell, Manchester, the sort of people who get put on CTOs are the same. We're all using it the same sort of way. It's the same sort of patient. He's late 30s, early 40s, more often man than woman, psychotic illness, usually living alone, uh, with no insight into, into his illness and often poor compliance, and usually uh, drifted away from their family. So we're using it consistently. But the other conclusion that um, Churchill drew was that the research base was pretty rubbishy. She was more polite than that, but it was rubbishy. Of those 72 studies, only nine of them were even vaguely scientific, attempting to compare and contrast. And only two of them were RCTs. And frankly, none of, none of the studies gave a clear uh, uh, indication of whether CTOs worked or did not work. The most common type of study, because it's easier to do, is what's called a case control study, or a before and after study. You get 100 patients or 1,000 patients who are on CTOs. You look at their hospitalization for two years before, and you look at their hospitalization for two years after. And lo and behold, you'll always find it's reduced. So it's a pretty dreadful way of testing it. You can improve that by matching them with other patients of the same age, same illness, same length of uh, disorder, and then testing them before, before and after. That's called an uncontrolled or a controlled before and after study. And these are the four main uh, before and after studies. <clears throat> now, the only important message to take from this is it's not consistent. Two of them show that CTOs reduce your rate of readmission. Two of them show that they increase it. The size of these blobs is the size of the population. The top one is from uh, Melbourne in uh, Victoria, Australia. Have any of you worked in Melbourne? Well, here's another little sobering fact, a bit like uh, corduroy trousers. In Victoria, in Melbourne, every thousandth person, not every thousandth adult, not every thousandth patient, every thousandth person is on a CTO. So there'd be at least half a CTO in here. Um, they love them. They absolutely love them. Uh, but they found that actually CTOs increase your readmission to hospital. So basically, all I would say you draw from that is the only way to resolve this is to go up the hierarchy that I showed you at the beginning and, and test using a randomized control trial. And there have been three of those. So before and after trials give differing uh, results. They all have severe methodological problems. You can't draw a conclusion. You've got to do an RCT. Now, RCTs aren't perfect but there's better than anything else. It's a bit like democracy. It may not be perfect, but it's better than the alternatives. Uh, no RCT is absolutely perfect. They all have, they have to adapt to their, their, their context. And for that reason, in that uh, evidence-based medicine, we've evolved techniques of being able to put RCTs together and test the, them all as one big RCT. But basically, I would suggest to you that if you want to know whether a, a CTO works or not, you need to do an RCT and you need to be guided by RCTs. All of you sitting here, if you go to your family doctor and you've got a heart problem or, or a prostate problem or, or, I don't know, a cancer, your doctor will hopefully follow that pyramid of evidence. He or she will almost exclusively 
draw their advice on how to treat you from randomized controlled trials. Virtually nowhere else in medicine. Uh, uh, surgery is different. No, almost nowhere else in medicine are major therapeutic decisions made except on the base of summated RCTs. So I'm suggesting that we in CTO practice should stick to that. What we did um, is we decided to do an English study. Smugly, I thought we were going to prove ourselves better. Uh, the Americans uh, had not shown that uh, CTOs work better, but I don't know if you've been to American mental health services. I mean, we've heard lots of what's wrong with our services today. It is nirvana compared to North America. Uh, the, the degree of neglect and abuse there is something most of us can't conceive. And I thought, well, the reason they aren't working, perhaps, in America is because they don't have social services. They don't have integrated mental health teams. They don't have all this. So if we do it in England, we might get a, uh, might get a result. And so OCTET is the Oxford Community Treatment Order uh, Evaluation Trial. <coughs> um, we, is, is what's called a pragmatic trial. That's to say, we asked doctors and teams to put forward to us anybody they were about to put onto a CTO that they were prepared for us to see, and we would randomise them either to voluntary treatment or CTO and follow them up for a year. We only worked with doctors and teams who accepted that they thought a CTO was good for the patient, but they accepted that they knew that they didn't know. This is what's called clinical equipoise. You can, you can believe it's a good idea, but you can know that you don't really know. And that's when you do trials. Trials are only ethical if you've got genuine uncertainty. So we only worked with teams that had genuine uncertainty, and the deal was two things. They would carry on their normal practice, irrespective of what the patient was, was allocated to, um, <clears throat> that they would give us every patient, not just hand-pick a few. Either they accepted the study was valid or not, uh, and nobody knows whether it's, you can choose a patient, because we don't know if it works even, and therefore, if they engaged with us, we've got all their CTO patients, and we randomly allocated them this way. We've got about 30 trusts who worked with us. We ended up with about 333 patients. And it's a lot of work getting 333 patients. We made one uh, intervention in, in, into their, their clinical service. And there's a reason for this. We said, we want you, irrespective of whether the patient gets a CTO or not a CTO, to aim to give them enhanced regular contact. And we reckoned about once a week because that's, these are your illest patients, that's about reasonable, that's what most decent assertive community treatment teams offer. So there's nothing exceptional. Try and offer it once a week. And then we left them alone and came back a year later. So as I say, it's, it's an agreed intervention, and the end intervention is simply the CTO. No extra treatment, no, no special services. An agreed targeted population, and that are people with psychotic illnesses at risk of relapse, which the team believes needs a, a, a CTO, and an agreed primary outcome, which is the rate of relapse in the first year. Um, and by the way, that's the same outcome that the other two American studies used. And one thing we, we were written up to, and this is one of the advances in medical uh, practice nowadays, is that the journals now are very strict that you must interpret and report your results in the way that you originally said you would. You can't just pick and choose the bits that you like. Because unfortunately, that's what one of the American studies did. It didn't report what it set out to test, reported something it thought was more interesting. Most journals now, the, this is the Lancet, this is published in, the Lancet actually have to have your protocol, which is published. They check your paper against the protocol, and if there's anything missing, they say put that in. If you've added something without having it in the protocol, they say take that out. So you have to have discipline in interpreting results. So, um, but even with that, you need to be clear about a couple of things. First of all, are the two groups the same? Because there's nothing magical about randomization. It's an attempt to get two equal groups, but you, things, it's random, so things can be different. Uh, so you test them at, uh, at the baseline characteristics, and we found that they were exactly the same. So you don't have to do any statistical cleverness to compare the two groups. So, so those getting voluntary care, those getting uh, CTO were the same. We also found, to our relief, that the treatments were the same. Uh, broadly described, they were getting a, 
an average of three contacts a month or uh, what's here called a median of just over two contacts a month. So being seen every 10 days in both groups. Pretty good care, I would suggest. And the other thing we were worried about um, is that, of course, one of the reasons I forgot to mention that CTOs were brought in was because of public concern about the misuse of Section 17. Because Section 17 was being used, uh, which is meant to be just for seven days, but it was being used by many psychiatrists, myself included, for months on end before we had CTOs. And, of course, it has none of the, uh, the uh, oversight and sanction that a CTO would have. And it is possible that people in the control group could have been kept on a Section 17 leave for months and months and months, uh, because that gives you almost the same um, powers. But luckily, uh, when we checked the data, we found that uh, they were only kept on it for about a, a week. Uh, whereas those who went on a CTO were on a CTO on average six months out of the first 12 months. So I think we can be pretty confident as we approach the results that the differences we find between the CTO group and the, uh, the voluntary group is down to the CTO. We can, I think we've focused it out, cleaned it out, and we've got, I think, a relatively clean experiment. So, what were the outcomes at 12 months? Well, you don't need a good statistician to tell you there's no difference between 36% and 36%. There was not a flicker of difference. A third of patients were readmitted if they were uh, put on the CTO arm, and a third of patients were admitted if they weren't put on the CTO arm. And that's a very sobering finding, I think. Now, that's our primary outcome, but we had another primary outcome. It's bad English, but you can have a secondary primary outcome in medicine. It's Alice in Wonderland. Um, our secondary out primary outcome was time to readmission, because it could just be that 36% in each group was readmitted, but that 36% in the CTO group stayed out of hospital for eight or nine months, and the, the, the voluntary group were in after three or four months. So you need what's called time to readmission. That's called a, a survival curve. And so we did that, and here you have the survival curve. And again, spooky, not a flicker of difference. Uh, I don't know if there are any real nerds amongst you, but living in Oxford, you have lots of nerds, and two people in my corridor got really excited about this. They said, that's a hazard ratio, Tom, of 1.00. I've never seen 1.00, but not a flicker of difference. So I'm afraid we were really thrown back. I mean, I was hoping for an outcome difference, and I was, I'd say, pretty depressed about it to begin with. But, you know, science is science. And as John Maynard Keynes says, when the evidence changes, I change my opinion, and I've had to change my opinion. So no difference at all. This is the three studies. There's a there's the New York study, which was probably a, a, a cock-up. But it was too early. Everything went wrong. It could go wrong. But there's no real difference there. No statistical difference. Uh, this is the North Carolina study. A lovely study. Really a good study. Uh, again, no difference. And though the what little non-significant difference there is goes the other way. And that's our study. Uh, you add them together, look at that. Uh, <laughs> CTOs, um, uh, 355, 155 admitted, non-CTOs, 153 admitted. There's no I mean, however you cut it, you can't find a difference. So, I think the truth is, they don't make a difference. Now, there's only three studies, and that's not a lot. But when three studies give you exactly the same result... You've either got to do a fourth study, or you've got to take them seriously, I would suggest. Now, um, when we did this, um, the Americans in particular, quite spuriously in my opinion, but still, they, they, they argued they only work if you keep people on them a long time. And they did some very, very, uh, well, I would say shady, I would actually say dishonest uh, publication of results. Because uh, they, they looked at the people who stayed on a CTO for six months and compared them with the people who didn't stay on a CTO for six months. Now, how many of you here are medics? Well, a basic rule of medicine is if the patient's doing well, you don't change the treatment. So it's not surprising. This is why uh, drug uh, uh, registration bodies never accept what's called a complete, completer analysis. You must look at everybody at the start, everybody at the end. You mustn't separate out those who did well. 
But we then wanted to test whether actually keeping people on longer was associated with doing better. And so we followed them up after another two years. So this is a three-year data. And frankly, you can see there are reasons for this little bit here, uh, which I, can, I won't bore you with. But basically, there is no difference. And these patients, by the way, were staying on their CTOs, most of them, over a year, sometimes two years. So even prolonging it doesn't seem to make a difference. Now, what's the current state of the evidence? I mentioned to you, now these are all the studies that we could identify recently. Uh, those reporting reductions in hospitalization if you're on a CTO, those reporting no difference, and those reporting, uh, sorry, those reporting increases on a CTO, and those no difference. And there's a color coding here. Uh, green is these simply getting a group of patients, comparing two years before, two years after. Often tiny little groups of patients, uh, 34 patients here, 21 patients in Suffolk, Complete rubbish. Why it's published, I don't know. The red studies are the ones that are randomized controlled trials or what are called meta-analyses. These are the ones that have scientific rigor. And you'll see the drift towards finding no difference is in the higher quality studies. Um, so in, in many ways, uh, some people would argue that evidence mixed. The evidence is only mixed if you in, mix in together high quality science with less high quality science. And just to be, um, it's a bit unfair of me to do this, but uh, just to, to, to drive it home, these are all the primary outcomes from all three RCTs. Uh, this is North Carolina, this is New York, this is us. This is the Cochrane collaboration uh, meta-analysis. And these are two further meta-analyses where they included the better quality, non-randomized ones. No difference anywhere except one random a finding in, in North Carolina that patients on CTOs were less likely to be victims of crime. You would expect in 20 outcomes to find at least one significance. So basically, I think I, I'm getting almost um, um, bad-mannered, really, by just going on about it. But uh, this is the last slide making the point. Uh, this is the, the, the Cochrane Review. You know how Cochrane Reviews work. You, you look, this is the point of difference. This is the... the uh, the range of outcomes, or uh, um, what's it called, the standard deviation. And if that crosses that line, if any of them cross that line, then it's a non-significant difference. So all of them cross that line, and in fact, when you add them up together, they're bang on the line. So however you cut it, high-quality evidence um, finds no effect for CTOs. Now, why no difference? And it was interesting the point uh, being made earlier about uh, whether to tell people they're, they're on section five or not. Um, one of the things that we realized talking to our patients is that whether they're on a CTO or not, they knew the score. People aren't daft. Most of these patients have been section three, four, five times. They know that no matter how much I smile and say you're, you're entirely free, if I get worried about them, I will section them. So to some extent, it may be that the, the fact that people are reflective human beings, they know that, I, that the, the doctor will intervene if he's worried about them, means they're likely to go along with it. So there is possibly that. There's another thing which, again, I think will surprise you. What I'm going to show you now, I, th I think will surprise you. It certainly surprised me. When we did our three-year follow-up, we looked at the treatment that people got after the study for the continuing three years. And our findings were genuinely, I think, amazing. These are 300 plus psychotic patients known to be non-cooperative. That's why they're being considered for a CTO. And irrespective of whether they're on a CTO or not over those three years, the, the teams maintained a contact with them about once a week nearly. So the idea that we don't keep contact with these people simply doesn't stand up to scrutiny. I think uh, our CMHTs are extremely good at assertively following up their most at-risk patients. Look at that. Uh, 3.6, 4.1, no difference at all, if anything, slightly more in favor of non-CTO. So we're doing an infinitely better job than we thought we were doing in following up people. Only 19 patients were lost to treatment over three years. I mean, some patients died, and a number of particularly Pakistani patients were sent back to families in Pakistan when they weren't getting better. But of the patients still, oh, somebody got to prison, but anybody who was still around in Britain and available for contact, was still being followed up. Only 6% weren't being followed up. Now, that, that's not how we talk about our services. 
But that's the figures. And this, by the way, is not some shishi academic unit. These are, you know, Cornwall, London, Birmingham, Nottingham, all over the place. So, my conclusion really from this was that modern mental health services, in the UK certainly, are much better at maintaining engagement and treatment than we believe. And I would think that CTOs were set up to address a problem that is probably historical. Uh, and even if it might not have worked even then. But the idea that, that, that all these people just drift out of care all the time, willy-nilly, simply doesn't, uh, doesn't stack up. So why do we continue? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. I mentioned the ones that uh, Canahan mentioned. You know, we, we have an attributional bias. We have a heuristic bias. We overlook uh, regression to the mean. So there, there are all these standard reasons. There are also professional reasons. Nearly all mental health professionals, all of us, are over-optimistic about what we have to offer our patients. We think our treatments are better than they are. And it's a damn good thing we do. Because we have to lend hope and share some sense of security. So we, we think they're better than they are. And we need to believe that. And we need also to, to, to infuse that in, into, into our relationship with the patients. Um, I forgot the other ones I put down, but I'll be very... A quick look. I'll cut those out. But you can see them there. Um, well, so, so the second one was uh, the, the fact that we misunderstand how, how, uh, how frequently we're seeing people. We are seeing them much better than we are. The other is a little bit of arrogance. Uh, nearly all doctors say, well, that may be the average, but in my hands, I'm much more skillful. I mean, there's a little bit of that for most of us. Let's accept that. Um, what worried me a bit when we presented this and gone around talking about it to, to, to clinicians is how many of them say things, which I think as a doctor is absolutely indefensible. Well, I have to, because the hospital expects it of me, or the team expects it of me. Uh, pressure from without. As, as a professional, you are personally, professionally accountable to your conscience and to your profession. If you think it's right for the patient, you should do it. If you don't, you shouldn't. But the number, particularly of younger consultants, who feel that the managers are telling them to do it has surprised me. I don't know if that goes on up here, but it certainly did in many of the other places. And the last one is just a personal one that I think if you work, I've worked for 40 years with people with chronic psychotic illnesses because I, I drifted into that end. You know, it can be, it can be quite demanding and it's, it's not nice to admit that you don't have the answer. And to some extent, it's a way of kidding yourself uh, that you've got more to offer than perhaps you do. So, uh, I've tried to explain to you why I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming. It's not strong enough evidence. We need half a dozen more studies, but it's all consistent. There's no, what, what the nerds called heterogeneity in the outcome. There's no variation. All the high quality studies show no benefit. And yet, we take away six months of a patient's life and frankly, now that we're beginning to follow up longer, much longer than that. The, the lobster pot is real. Once you're in it, how do you prove you can come off it? If, you, if you're well, it proves it's working. If you're not well, it proves you need it. So to some extent, I think we need to think hard about it. We've got 4,000 a year. Um, and given the, the only evidence we've got, we have evidence, not that we have no evidence. Given that all the evidence shows it's, it's ineffective, should we still be doing it? And I, I just show you this. This is... Uh, modified insulin coma therapy. This was from 1934 to 1954, considered in most of the Western world the most scientifically advanced treatment for schizophrenia. And the fascinating thing about modified insulin coma treatment is that it's the first medical treatment, not the first psychiatric treatment, the first medical treatment in any branch that was stopped because one RCT showed it didn't work. So I bring you bad news, I'm afraid. CTOs don't work. I know the pressure you're under to use them. I understand how difficult it is, but they don't work, and we need to think, why do we continue doing this? <laughs>